this morning we come to uh, the end of our study of this letter that Paul wrote to the Philippian church. In this passage we'll see that there's a special relationship that exists between the pastor and the congregation that he serves and that, uh, that relationship is a two-way relationship. Uh, you see the congregation the congregation grows spiritually from the word that they receive from the pastor and the pastor is rewarded by their growth. And I think we see that. That's why Paul is able to say in verse 1 of these Philippians, he calls them my, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown. Pray with me just a moment. Lord, we are grateful again to be able to come to gather, together and hear your word. Uh, Lord, we thank you for, for Paul's letter here to the Philippian church, the inspired word of God that you gave to him. Uh, Lord, we're grateful for this study that we've had over the past uh, oh, nearly uh, five and a half months now. Lord, we've been studying the book of Philippians. So, Lord, you know, just uh, let us finish this well. Uh, Lord, let us, uh, let us leave here with greater understanding than we had when we came in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, preachers preach. That's what preachers do. Paul, Paul referred to preachers, uh, compared them, I guess I should say, with farmers. He said in 2 Timothy 2, verse 6, the hard-working farmer must be first partake of the crops. So what he's saying there is when a preacher works hard at preaching, he should be able to, uh, to receive reward, to, uh, uh, to take of the, uh, uh, the crop, the work that he's done. Pastors, they get their joy. They get their encouragement. They get their strength. They get their motivation from the churches that they serve. Uh, I can tell you it's a great reward whenever I as a pastor look out and I see the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God that's been delivered through me within the church. I'm, I'm rewarded by that. I'm encouraged by that. And I, I need, and every pastor needs that encouragement. Every pastor needs to know that kind of joy because it's that kind of, of joy uh, that provides the, the motivation that the pastor needs to keep working, to keep moving forward. The church's power is not found in its past. The church's power is found in its future. We'll only know how powerful we are as a church uh, when in the future we see the results that we've had. With all of that said, we want to spend a little time this, moment, this morning focusing on the present. And for the present this morning, we want to look at Philippians chapter 4. I read that first verse where Paul calls uh, the Philippians his brethren, his long for, his joy, his crown. And I say, how do you respond to that, Paul? How do you respond to that? It's obvious you have a really good relationship uh, with this Philippian church. They've been very good to you. I read this passage and I see how good they've been to you. How do you respond to that, Paul? How do you, how do you answer to that? And I think as I read through this passage, Paul's response to them could be summed up in one word, gratitude. Paul is grateful. They we see that in verse 10. Paul says, uh, Paul says there, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Paul, uh, Paul was thankful to God. Thankful to God. That, that's evidence that Paul's heart was a grateful heart. He says in verse 10, the whole verse there, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked the opportunity. Paul says, I'm grateful to God for providing for me through you Philippians, through the church there. He said, you care for me, but you like opportunity in the past. Paul, Paul had a grateful heart. He had gratitude toward this gift that he had received from the Philippians. That's what he was grateful for. He had received a material gift, a financial gift from the Philippian church. In our day and time, we might call it a love offering. They had taken up to send to Paul uh, to provide for his needs while he was there in prison in Rome. He writes in verse 11, Not that I speak in regard to need and, and have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound and everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. 
He goes on in verse 13, I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well uh, that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in, in, uh, in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica, uh, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds uh, to your account. Verse 18, I'm reading a long passage here. Verse 18 says, Indeed I have all, and abound I am full, having received from Epaphroditus, that being a man, the things uh, that you sent, uh, that, the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma and acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Jesus Christ. Now to you, I'm sorry, now to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's a long passage, and I read it as a block, but there's really one word this morning that I want to concentrate on and all of that for just a moment, and it's the one word found in verse 11. Content. Content. Paul says there in verse 11, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. The word content, it means to be satisfied. It means to lack for nothing. Paul says, I'm satisfied. I lack for nothing. I am content. And Jesus once told us in Luke 3 verse 14 that we should be content with our wages. We should be satisfied with what we receive for the work that we do. A lot of people in our day and age want to argue about their salary, about how much money they're making all the time. Jesus said, be content. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verse 6, he says, now godliness with contentment is a great gain. Uh, so when we're content and we're living a godly life, that's a great gain to us. 1 Timothy 6, verse 8, he says, and having food and clothing with these, we should be content." We should be content just to have our basic needs met. We don't really need more than that. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 13 verse 5, be content with such things as you have. Paul says I'm content. Content. To be content is a, a spiritual quality. It's a quality. It's a virtue, you might say, to be content in this way. It, 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 it's something we all should desire. It's something we all should aspire to, uh, to have contentment like Paul has here. Paul says, I'm content. He says, I've got all I need. I, I'm satisfied. I lack for nothing. Now, that's a, that's a pretty amazing statement when you consider Paul's circumstances. Paul was in prison. He was locked up in chains, literally in a Roman prison. Yet he says, I'm content. I'm sure he was there a long time. A long time, some say as much as, uh, as 10 years or longer that Paul was in prison. Uh, but uh, during that time, I'm sure there were days when he didn't have enough to eat, when he didn't have enough to drink. I'm sure there were days he mentions when he was, when he was cold, didn't have, his clothing wasn't adequate, yet he says, I'm content. Paul says, I've learned how to do that. I've learned how to be content. Paul was, uh, according to verse 6, anxious for nothing. Paul had, in verse 7, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Paul knew, in verse 9, the peace of God. Paul was content. Paul was content because he knew. He had faith. He trusted in God to provide for his basic needs. Paul was grateful. He was grateful to God for the gift that he had received from the Philippian church. He says in verse 10, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that, I, uh, that now at last your care for me has flourished again, uh, though you surely did care but lack the opportunity. Now, at that point, at that point it had been nearly 10 years since Paul had received any kind of aid uh, from the Philippian church. Up until the, the time that he started going into prison, the Philippians had been good about providing for Paul. But now it's been a very long time since he had received anything from them. Now Paul, he didn't seem to have any problem with that. He wasn't angry about it. He didn't hold any grudge against them. He, he simply says, you lack the opportunity. 
He said, I knew you cared for me, but for some reason, and he doesn't tell us why, there's no explanation here, that, that giving to Paul had stopped for a long period of time. Paul, Paul didn't seem to be upset by that. He just seems to be grateful at this point that God had opened the door again, and now he was receiving this blessing from the Philippians. Paul knew. Paul knew that God was in control. Paul trusted in God to provide. And now here the door had been opened and Paul says, I have what I need. I'm content. Paul understood he really didn't need much. I think that's a great lesson we need to learn in our, our culture today, one we've forgotten. I remember my grandfather talking about in the Depression era how little they had and how they, they still got by because they had what they needed. We live in a culture where everybody seems to want more, where everybody seems to want something bigger, something better. <laughs> Beverly hates it. Have you seen that commercial that's on television by the Morgan & Morgan, uh, what is it, the lawyers? The people that sue each other all the time, they have that woman on there named Miss Moore who wants more. No offense to the Moore family, but uh, she, she's always wanting more. <laughs> And that's kind of the culture we live in, a culture that wants more and more. And Paul says, we don't really need all of that. I'm, I'm content with having a little. He says in verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Paul, Paul that's pretty simple. Pretty simple. He says, whatever state I'm in, what, what, when I have a little, I'm content. When I have a lot, I'm content. I, I'm content either way. I hear all that and I think a lot about other pastors and Paul speaking from a pastor's perspective here, but I, I think of all the hell, well, prosperity type preachers that are on television in this day and time. And they're constantly telling people, if you like something, if, 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 you're, if you're sick, if you're poor, if, if, you're, uh, if all of your earthly dreams have not come true, then all you have to do is go to God. And tell him what you want, and God will deliver. God's going to give you everything that you want if you'll just go uh, to God and ask him for it. And I tell you, that's not true. God doesn't give us what we want. God gives us what we need. I think that message is, uh, is devastating to some people because they, they throw out something to God. Some frivolous thing. I, I want a, a Cadillac. I want a new car. And they don't get it. And it, it flattens their faith. It damages their faith. So I believe those kinds of messages that we hear from those kinds of preachers is hurtful, damaging to their faith. They, they ask God, they don't receive, therefore they reject God. They say, God, does, God doesn't care about me. He doesn't provide for me. Paul wasn't like that. Paul says, I don't need much. I just need my food, I need my clothes. And God's providing that. Paul, by no means, was a wealthy man. You might say he was a wealthy man spiritually. Spiritually, he was, he was a very wealthy man, but materially, I, I can tell you, Paul didn't have very much. Paul understood Jesus' teachings. In Matthew 6, verse 31, Jesus said, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, uh, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will, will uh, worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to drink. Don't worry about whether you're going to have enough clothes or not. Jesus said, put the things of God first. Put the kingdom of God first. If you put the kingdom of God first in your life, then all of these things will be added. Now, when Jesus said all of these things, what was he talking about? Food and something to drink and clothes. He wasn't saying if you, if you uh, uh, put the things of God first, you're going to get a new house, you're going to get a new bass boat, you're going to get this. You're going to have a, a million dollars in the bank. He said, if you'll put the things of God first, your basic needs will be met by God. That's what God's promised. There's nothing more than that. Anything beyond that is a blessing from God. But, uh, but what God is concerned about is that we put the kingdom of God first and then he's going to provide what we need. Paul says, I'm content. 
I'm content. I, I don't have a lot of possessions, but I have uh, enough. He says, whatever circumstances I find myself in, whether I have a lot or whether I have a little, he said, my life bounced back and forth. There have been days when I had a little, and there have been days when I had a lot, but in either case, I've learned how to be content. I've learned how to be satisfied with what I have. He says in verse 12, I know how to be abased. That means poor. I know how to, how to abound. That means rich. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul says it, it doesn't matter whether I have a little or whether I have a lot. I, I've learned how to be content. Paul understood the power of God. He understood the power of God. He says in verse 13, a very popular verse. I, I always think of Tim Tebow, the football player, because he always used this verse. My kids went around with, a, with this verse written on the backs of their football helmets because a famous football player used it all the time, and that's a good thing. But verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul's saying I can be content. By the power of God, I can be content whether I have a little or I have enough. Uh, have, have a lot. Paul says it, it doesn't matter. By the power of God, I can do all things. God strengthens me. Paul knew that there was no way that he was ever going to find contentment in this life under his own power. Paul knew that in order to be content, he had to rely on the power of God. He understood what Isaiah said in Isaiah 40, verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God's power. God's power is always revealed in human weakness. Scripture says, Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. God's power shows up when we're at our weakest point because it's when we're at our weakest point that God empowers us. God empowers us to overcome that weakness. We like to think of Paul as being a great man. And spiritually, in a way, he was on human terms. But understand, Paul really wasn't all that great. He was just a man. Really no different than any other, any other man. Paul did some wonderful things. He proclaimed the gospel to the Gentiles. Can't get much better than that. He established churches all over the place. He suffered a lot. He went through a lot of hardships for the sake of Jesus Christ. But Paul didn't do any of that by his own power. Paul did all of that by the power of God working through him, and Paul understood that. Paul knew that had it been left up to him, he would have failed a long time ago. Everything that he had accomplished was accomplished by the power of God. So Paul says, I'm content. I'm content because I trust in God. I'm content because I know God's going to provide for me. I'm content because I know the power of God is working through me and God isn't going to let me fail. There was another reason why Paul understood contentment. He, he understood that if he really wanted to be content, he needed to focus on others rather than himself. That's why I say there's this relationship between Paul and these Philippians working here, which I believe is true of any pastor and the church that he's serving. Paul wasn't centered on himself. Paul was centered on the people in the churches that he, he was, he was uh, pastoring, that he was uh, teaching to. He wasn't worried about his own needs. wasn't worried about his own situation. He was worried about theirs. But think about the reverse of that. Because of that, Paul was receiving blessings from the Philippians. While he was concerned about them, they were concerned about Paul. Nobody was self-centered here. Nobody was thinking about themselves. Paul was concerned over the Philippians. The Philippians were concerned over Paul. Nobody wants to hang out with a person who is self-centered and only worries about themselves all the time. People like to hang out with people who are who are uh, uh, focused in on providing and helping others who are, who are in need. So, so both we have a mutual relationship here between Paul and the Philippian church. They were, they were taking care of him, and he was, he was spiritually taking care of them. Paul says in verse 14, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the, the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, 
No church share would be concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even at Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessity. This church in Philippi, they have been very good at providing materially, but naturally for Paul's needs. Even after he left Macedonia and went into other places, and uh, Philippi is in Macedonia, but when he left there, he went into other places like Thessalonica. They still continued to provide for him materially. They sent him money, they sent him food, they sent him clothing, they sent him what he needed. It. Thessalonica was a much wealthier city than Philippi. Philippi was known as being relatively poor. Yet even when he went to Thessalonica, they still continued to provide for him when the Thessalonicans didn't do anything. Even when Paul went to a, a very wealthy city named Corinth, uh, the Philippians still provided for him. He wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 9. He says, when I was present with you, when I was there in Corinth, and I was in need, he says, I, I, I burdened no one. He said, I didn't go to any of you Corinthians asking for anything. He said, I didn't do that. I didn't do that for what I lacked in the brethren who came from Macedonia supply. He said, even though I was there with you and I was in need and I, I needed some things, you didn't provide for me and I didn't ask you for anything. Instead, the brothers up in Macedonia, that being Philippi, they sent what I lacked. They sent what I needed. But here at this point in, in the writing of this letter of Philippians, it's been 10 years. Ten years since he had received anything from Philippi. And again, I say Paul wasn't upset about that. He, he knew they cared for him. Something had come up. I don't know whether there was an economic famine or something going on in Philippi, but for whatever reason, for ten years, they were unable to provide Paul. And now God's opened the door, and the, the gift has come, and Paul is grateful. He explains why he's grateful in the next verse, because it's not the kind of gratefulness we might think it is. Paul says in verse 17, Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Paul says, I wasn't seeking anything from you, Philippians. I wasn't expecting anything. I'm grateful to get it because I know God has sent it. But mostly what I'm grateful for is because I know God is going to credit this to your spiritual account. He understood that he was blessed by God through the gift that he had received from the Philippians, but he also understood that because of their sacrifice, because they had collected this from among the families there in the church and given it to Paul, they also would be blessed by God. They knew, Paul knew, that they were storing up treasure in heaven. He knew that everything that they were doing for him would be credited to their spiritual account. It's a lesson we need to understand. We need to understand. Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Paul says, you know, when, when you give to the Lord, when you give to the Lord, the Lord's going to take care of you. Paul says, I'm grateful because God has provided for me through you and Philippi, but I'm also aware of the fact that you Philippians are being blessed because, because you've given this gift. He says in verse 18, Indeed, I have all and abound. I'm full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent to from you. He says, I have everything I need. Now, I don't lack for anything. I'm content because what you provided for me has provided everything I need. It came by this messenger to sent this guy named Epaphroditus. And then he adds something that's interesting to me. He adds something that comes straight out of the Old Testament in verse 18. He says, a sweet smelling aroma and an acceptable sacrifice well pleasing to God. Those are the same words that the Old Testament writers would have used when they made a burnt offering, when they made a grain offering, when they put something on the altar and they burned it and the smoke went up. The incense that represented prayer, what's considered to be a sweet-smelling aroma that went up to, to God. He says, this sacrifice that you made on my account is a sweet-smelling aroma to God. God is pleased, he's saying, with you Philippians for what you have done for my sake. 
But Paul also knew that God would supply for the Philippians. They didn't have to worry about giving too much because if they gave, uh, Paul knew that God was going to give back to them. Philippians 4 verse 19, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Not only would, the Paul, uh, would the Philippians receive uh, replacement from God for what they had given, they also would receive the spiritual blessings that come from knowing Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm confident. I'm confident God's going to take care of you Philippians. Now that brings us this morning to the final four verses of this book of Philippians. And uh, let me read this to you as a block. Verse 20. Uh, now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Uh, the brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you. But especially those who are Caesar's household, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, be with you all. Amen. I could go a lot of places with those four verses. I probably should have made another sermon and preached a whole other message from those four verses. But this morning, I want to concentrate on just one word that Paul used twice there, and that's the word saints. Saints. There are a lot of people who don't understand the word saints. There are a lot of Christians who would say, well, I'm not a saint. I'm not good enough to be a saint. They say I'm not a saint because they believe that to be a saint means that you have to be pious, that you have to be some uh, uh, heavily uh, righteous kind of a person, that you have to be a really good person in order to be a saint. That's not what Scripture means by saints. Some people get confused, uh, and I think some of that comes from the Catholic Church because they canonize saints. They have certain people that they've uh, canonized into sainthood, St. Mary, St. Uh, James, St. Peter, St. Paul, those sorts of, of folks. Those kinds of saints, they live in the stained glass windows around the churches. I heard a story once about a little Catholic boy who said, I don't ever want to be a saint. And somebody asked him why. He said, because they blocked the sunlight out. I don't want sunlight to get blocked out. Saints don't live in stained glass windows in churches. When Paul uses this word saint, he's referring simply to all Christians. All Christians. All Christians are saints. Look at how he uses the word here in verse 21. He says, greet every saint in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 22, he says, all the saints greet you. He's telling them down there in Philippi. Greet all of those saints down there in Philippi. Philippi was a large city. I'm sure the church had a lot of people in it. He says, all of those people down there in Philippi, they're all saints. Greet all of them for me. He says, all of us saints up here in Rome, all of those saints up here in Rome, we're greeting you, especially those who are Caesar's household, even some of the people that were serving Caesar. The Roman government had now become Christians, and Paul says, they're saints. They're saints. So all of us, look at the number of saints he's talking about there. Everyone who places faith in Jesus Christ is a saint. The word saint there in the uh, Greek language of the New Testament is translated there from the word hagios. And that word hagios, it means someone who's set aside. Someone who is separated. Someone who is uh, uh, sanctified. Someone who is righteous. That means anyone who's been separated from their sin by their faith in Jesus Christ. Anyone who is going through the process, as we've talked about, of becoming sanctified. Anyone who has the imputed righteousness of Christ in them because they believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior is a saint. Paul says every Christian, every Christian is a saint. To be a saint it has nothing to do with how good you are. It has nothing to do with whether or not you've been recognized by uh, the Catholic Church or some other organization as being a saint. It has everything to do with your faith in Jesus Christ. I think about that Corinthian church we talked about a little bit earlier. Of all the churches that Paul ever established and, and dealt with and had, to, uh, had issues with over the years you read his letters, you understand the Corinthian church had a lot of problems. Of all of the, uh, the churches Paul dealt with, they were the ones that had the most trouble with sin coming into the church. There were some real dingers, you might say, in the church in Corinth. 
Yet Paul, when he writes to them in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, the very first time he wrote to them, he says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be what? To be saints? With all who are in every place called, who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ as Lord. Paul says, even though you Corinthians have some problems down there and there's some sin and stuff coming into your church, you're still saints. So it didn't have anything to do with how good they were. He says, you're saints. Why? Because you call on the name Jesus our Lord. Everyone who does that is a saint. So to be a saint is to be a Christian. And I understand, saints don't worship saints. We don't bow down and, and worship Mary. We don't, we don't pray to Mary. We don't pray to Peter. We don't pray to James. We don't pray to John. We pray to God. We worship the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says in the next verse, verse 20, Now uh, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. All glory. All glory belongs to God forever and forever. God, Scripture says, does not share His glory with anyone, including those that would be called saints. Paul closes this letter, and again, I'm repeating some of these verses, but in verse 21, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you. But especially those who are of Caesar's household, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. He says, greet every saint. Paul showing great humility there. He's showing us that every saint, every believer in Jesus Christ is worthy of recognition. Every believer is worthy of our affection. Every believer is worthy of, uh, of our, our greeting. We don't, we don't hold any saint above any other saint. We don't push any saint down below any other saint. We all consider every saint to be better than ourselves. And then Paul closes with a simple one-line prayer there. He prays for what every saint needs. He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of our, we all need the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what every saint needs the most. Every believer in Jesus Christ needs the grace of our Lord constantly flowing over us. So Paul prays for the Philippian church. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And then he says, Amen. A simple word that means so be it. So be it. And that ends our study of the book of Philippians. I, I hope you've enjoyed this because we've been in it for quite a while. I know I have. I've learned a lot from, uh, uh, from preparing for these messages. And next Sunday is uh, the Sunday before Independence Day, 4th of July, and I prepared a, a kind of a, an independence message, you might say, for, uh, uh, for that Sunday. But after that, after much prayer, much thought, much consideration, I'll be leading you into a study of the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. And you can be reading 1 Timothy ahead if you like 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy is a great book. It contains a lot, a lot of church doctrine. Church doctrine, how the church is to stand, how the church is to operate. I think we'll find this interesting. Sometimes it can be controversial, and we'll talk about some of that controversy as some people interpret things within 1 Timothy maybe differently than we do as Baptists. But uh, I think this will be an interesting study. I think you'll like it. I think there's a lot there for us to learn. But I'm grateful this morning for the, the letter that Paul writes to Philippi because we've learned a lot from it over the past month. We'll close there and we'll end with a song. Let's all stand and we're gonna, we're gonna sing number 14.
uh, see me as being uh, worthy of their provision. Uh, Lord, I'm just grateful for all that you do here in this church and let us continue to serve you well in whatever way you choose to send us. Uh, Lord, bless us as we go from here. Let us be safe, let us be healthy, and let us serve you well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.